<clears throat> well, good evening, guys. How are you guys doing? Good. All right, I'm doing good. Uh, if you have your uh, Bibles, uh, your iPads, or iPhones, or I, does anybody have do you use iPod still? You have an iPod, you know? <laughs> Open that up. Um, and today's text is going to be uh, Romans chapter 6, uh, verses 12 to 23. Romans 6, 12 to 23, and I'll give you a moment to find your places so that we can all read it together. <clears throat> Romans 6, 12 to 23. And I'll be reading out of the NRSV. It goes like this. It says, Therefore, do not let sin exercise dominion in your mortal bodies to make you obey their passions. No longer present your members to sin as instruments of wickedness, but present yourself to God as those who have been brought from death to life. Present your members to God as instruments of righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you, since you are not under law, but under grace. What then? Should we sin because we are not, we are not under law, but under grace? By no means. Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves to the one whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness. But thanks be to God that you, having once been slaves, <coughs> which you were entrusted, and that you, having been set free from sin, have become slaves of righteousness. <coughs> I am speaking in human terms because of your natural limitations. For just as you once presented your members as slaves to impurity, and to greater and greater iniquity. So now present your members as slaves to righteousness for sanctification. When you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. So what advantage did you get, did you then get from the things of which you are now ashamed? The, th end of those, the end of those things is death. But now that you have been free from sin and enslaved to God, the advantage you get is sanctification. The end of eternal life. <clears throat> the end is eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Let us pray. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, um, thank you for the gift that we have in you, the gift of our salvation through Christ Jesus. We come before you, Lord, as people that don't deserve anything but the things that come to us because of our human nature. But because of your son, we can sit here in your grace and we can just say, thank you, Father God, and we are, are indebted to you. Uh, today, as we hear your words, God, just open up our hearts and minds, open up um, something so that we may hear, that we may see, that we may know the truth, and that it shall set us free. Um, speak to every person in this room. And let your will be done in our lives, Lord, so that we may live our life, live out our faith for you and for others, Lord, and for ourselves. Um, we uh, give ourselves wholly unto you, and by your grace, we say amen. amen. <clears throat> Las Vegas is embracing its original ties to organized crime by opening up a $42 million museum of American, you know, mob you know, crime. And it's called the mob experience. The mob experience. Pretty cool name, right? There one can one can view Bugsy Siegel's pistol with whom he murdered hundreds of people. Another part of the wall is from the St. Valentine's Massacre. You guys ever heard of the St. Valentine's Massacre? Um, that happened in Chicago. And that will be on display um, as well as a barber chair from Albert Anastasia's life where it came to an end in 1957. Have you guys ever watched The Godfather? Oh, I love those movies. I watch at least every six months, you know, like if I could. Uh, so uh, just thinking of that and thinking of Las Vegas and thinking of Las Vegas uh, kind of immortalizing those people in this museum. The mayor of Las Vegas, Oscar Goodman, says this. He says, this is the story of America. Uh, it would seem the community leaders of Las Vegas have no shame about the mob 
and the death and havoc that they uh, that they under, that it is submerged to the city that wants control because in those days Las Vegas was controlled by the mob, and if you owe the mob, if you were in debt to the mob, you were their slave. You were you were theirs, and if you didn't comply, if you didn't um, pay them, whatever you were. Well, and I have other words for that, but we are in church today, so I won't use those. <clears throat> and it would seem the civic leaders need to be converted and put away that and put away that of which all of us should be ashamed. And I think that is what Paul is saying to us today in this scripture, in this passage, right? And it says, therefore, right? You ever heard that? Therefore? So whenever Paul's says something, right, da 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 therefore, da 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 It's there for a reason, right? He's saying something that he's kind of adding to that. And he's saying, therefore, do not let sin exercise dominion in the mortal bodies to make you obey their passions, right? We have been given this new life. Now, obviously, Paul is talking to Christians, right, in Rome. He's not talking to unbelievers because if he was talking to unbelievers, they would have no idea, they would have no clue. So why would he even talk to unbelievers. He's talking to the Christians in there. They may have been Christians for 5, 10, 20 years. I don't know how long they're Christian. But he's talking to a group of Christians in the church in Rome. He's telling them, you know what, like, that life that you used to live, that life that used to control you, you're not that person no more. You are free. You, you no longer live under that control. You no longer live under those things that you once obeyed, that had you I um, mean, I don't like to use the word slave, but, you know, that's what Paul's saying as a slave, right? Um, when we think of slavery, we think of evil, we think of pain, we think of injustice, we think of, of, of bad connotations with that word, right? Like as I said, if you were in the days of Vegas or even back in, in the East Coast, in New York, New Jersey, like the mob ran everything. Like, and if you were part of the mob, you know, like you were under the control and if, you were a politician or a cop, man, most likely you were under their control because they had the money, they had the clout, and they made you do, they made you serve them, right? Whatever they wanted, you had to do. So sin is kind of like that, right? Like, it has power and dominion. And when it entraps you, when it enslaves you, it makes you do the things that you may not normally do. But when you're in the power of sin, man, you do it. <clears throat> Because you don't know no better, right? And it, it entraps you and it encapsulates you. I know because, you know, I'm a sinner. I used to, I mean, I used to do things back in the day before I became a Christian that I wasn't proud of. I'm sure all of you have done things that you're not proud of, right? But unlike you, I, I didn't grow up in the church. I didn't know what the Bible was. I didn't know, I mean, I don't know who God was. I don't know who Jesus was because it's kind of a cultural thing, right? Jesus especially if you're Latino, like in the Latino context, you grow up Catholic. And you know, you, you learn about the Catholic Catholicism, the Virgin Mary, making your, you know, uh, 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 your first communion and catechism and all that stuff that you kind of, oh, you got to do these things to get closer to God. But I was still sin. I still had this under the power of grace. So it doesn't matter what religion can do. Religion can't do anything. It has no power to dispel the power of sin, right? So I was living this life of sin, living this life of violence and of, 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 of trying to find my way and trying to enlist these passions that I thought that would give me joy and give me peace and give me happiness and give me a future. But little by, but little, by little, I knew that that wasn't what it was giving me. It was giving me despair. It was giving me darkness, pain and suffering and violence and something I didn't want to live my life that way. And I'm sure you don't want to live your life that way. Back then, you probably didn't want to live your life that way. Or if you're living your life right now like that, maybe you're like, man, I don't want to live this way no more. <clears throat> so Paul is saying, that's your old life. Don't live. Why do you still live your life as though you are living in the old way? You know? Remember, I mean, it's okay to remember what we were doing back in the day, but this is a new day. And these are new times, and when Christ comes into your life, you know, he's going to work in your life and going to change you in some ways, hopefully. <clears throat> um, so it is only by grace that we have hope. Only by grace in Christ Jesus that we have hope. 
Um, Romans 7, 14 through 21 says, For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am of the flesh, sold into slavery under sin. I do not understand my own actions, for I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Now, if I do what I do not want, I agree that the law is good, right? But in fact, it is no longer I that do it, but sin that dwells within me. For I know that nothing good dwells within me that is in my flesh. I can will what is right, but I cannot do it. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I do, right? Now, if I do what I do not want, it is, it is no longer I that do it, but the sin that dwells within me, right? My tongue kind of hurts right now. <laughs> Try saying that like 10 times really fast, right? Sometimes I wonder if, if, if Paul did on purpose, you know, kind of like, you know, kind of trip us up. Every time I, I would go to church or Bible study, I would, I would laugh at the pastor and read his passages. I was like, ah, you know, you got tongue twisted over there. Uh, so then, with my mind, I am a slave to the law of God, but with my flesh, I am a slave to the law of sin. So it is by the grace that we have hope, right? It is by the grace we have hope. Now, mind you, when Paul is writing this, some commentaries, some scholars believe that it is pre-conversion, uh, pre-conversion that Paul's talking about, but I happen to believe it's post-conversion, right? Because no matter if we, no matter if you're a Christian and you, you've been converted and you, and you have this often conversion with Christ and, and God may have spoken to you through miracles, you may have spoken to you through, you may have seen a sign or wonder, you still live in this flesh. You still live in, the, in this thing called flesh and you're still bound to sin, you're still prone to all the things that happen because of this fallen state of our flesh or the world, whatever you may call it. So I, I'm thinking that Paul is talking here about his, pre, his uh, post-conversion. Now, I may be wrong, right? But who knows? No one, no one really knows for sure. It's, it's, it's a debate. But speaking from a, a, a person, speaking from a man, or maybe looking from a, from a woman's perspective, sin is sin, man. It is powerful. And sometimes we are weak. Sometimes we are vulnerable. Sometimes we or do things that we don't want to do, but we do it. Why? Because we're, we live under that power of that slavery to sin. But what Paul is saying is that you are no longer slave to that sin. You no longer have that power to have, to have dominion over you. But you know, it's, about, it's a mind thing, right? It's a mind thing. Romans 12, uh, 1, right? Renew your, let's, let's go there. Romans 12, chapter 1, right? Let's go there. Romans chapter 12. And we all know that verse, right? You've heard, you've probably heard so many sermons preached on verse 12, right? One and two, right? There was a joke in Bible college, and I kid you not, I kid you not, that, that scripture was, was preached at least seven times in one week, like whether it was in class, whether it was in chapel, whether it was part of a lecture, or whatever it be, like, it was like, and there was this big old joke on Romans 12, one, two, that's like the go-to sermon, right? But it's therefore, it's there for a reason, right? It says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, right? By the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God and what is good and acceptable and perfect, right? So it's, it's not just about overcoming the flesh and overcoming sin, because we're, there's no power in that, right? I mean, I don't have the power to overcome sin by myself. It has to be from God. It has to be from Christ. It has to be the Holy Spirit working inside of us and changing us and changing our mind and saying, God, here I am. Today's a new day. I know what I can do. I know what I'm capable of doing, and I love you, but sometimes I do what I don't want to do, and I love you and I want to serve you, but sometimes it's hard. Sometimes life happens. Sometimes I don't understand why things happen, and I'm going to go do this so they can make me feel better, have a better day. You ever, you ever like, been on fire for Jesus, and then a couple of weeks later something happens, and you, and you do something that, you know, you, that you, your flesh wants, right? And you, and you crave that after you do it. You're like, what did I just do? Right? What did I just, what did I just get myself into? It's about being renewed by your mind, about letting the Holy Spirit renew you and, and, and take you and shape you and transform you. And it doesn't happen every, it doesn't happen overnight. It doesn't happen in a year or two. It might take 10, 20, 30. So sometimes it's a lifelong journey, a lifelong process, right? 
But thanks be to God for his grace. Thanks be to God for his power. Thanks be to God for his Holy Spirit. It is only by grace that we have hope. <clears throat> the second, one of the second points I want to share with you as well is uh, we are free in Christ to live out our faith despite our sin nature. We are free to live in Christ despite our faith. <clears throat> despite live out our faith despite our sin nature. Verse 19. Again, it says, I'm speaking in human terms because of your natural limitations. In the Greek, it means it also it says, for of your weakness of your flesh. For just as you once presented your members as slaves to impurity and to greater and greater iniquity, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness for sanctification. Right? For now present your members as slaves to righteousness for sanctification. What is sanctification? <laughs> That's a word that, you know, like, you don't use every day. Oh, I'm, sanct you know, I'm sanctified. Like, how was your sanctification, sanctified day, you know? <laughs> um, so what I've always learned and what I've always, uh, you know, uh, what I've always learned or what I've, what I've learned or what I've heard been said is that sanctification is, is, uh, is, how does it go? I had them in my mind and I lost it. You know, sorry about that. But something about, you know, along the lines of, you know, like, you're saved, but it's a process. Sanctification is a life on, it doesn't happen instantly. Uh, I come from Assemblies of God circles, and they teach that, like a holy, a second work of grace, right? You're filled with the Holy Spirit, you speak in tongues, uh, and that's a sign of the Holy Spirit dwelling in you, right? Which I don't, I don't agree with that. I mean, I do believe in speaking, you know, people can speak in tongues, and I do believe in sign miracles and all that, but I believe there's an order, but I do believe that if you are saved and he has got to be in your life, you have the Holy Spirit in you already. Amen? And it doesn't, it doesn't mean that you're going to be instant holy right away, because I wasn't. After I got saved, you know what I did the next day? I drank a beer. <laughs> you know, not that, you know, drinking beer is bad, but where I come from, oh, my God, that's detestable, you know. You don't can't drink a beer. You you're sinning. You're supporting the beer company. So I'm like, well, Jesus drank wine. I mean, he didn't drink it to get drunk, but it, you know, it has alcohol in there, right? Um. So, it is because of this whole sin nature, because of this this flesh and this law, that we have grace and hope. And because of Christ, we are free to live out our faith despite our sin nature. We are free to live out our faith despite our sin nature. <clears throat> and I, and I, as, I, as I read this, I kind of wrestled with this because I'm like, I kind of wrestled with this because like Romans is a, it's like one of those, those books of the Bible that you hate it, but you love it, right? Like, oh man, this is awesome. Oh, but then, okay, I want you to write a paper. Uh, uh, I want you to write an exegetical paper on that. I'm like, book, man. Like, ugh, you know what I mean? Like, you get that? I hate Paul. I hate Romans. Why do I have to write that, man? You know? But so as I, as I wrestle with this, I'm like, man, this is like a lot of stuff in here, man. Like, I mean, you can like preach on this, let alone this passage for like maybe like a six-week series, a six-week series or whatever. But I get what Paul's saying. I get what he's trying to tell the church of Rome that, yeah, you are, you used to be sin, you used to be sinners, you used to live that life. But look at what you have now. And you have a future and a hope that you didn't have before, right? And even if you do, do still sin, because just because we have grace, you know, this gives us a, a, a past to sin. But even if you do have, you fall short, you do have sin in your life, you have Christ. Thanks be to God, amen? Because Christ is the only one that can set us free. You can't set yourself free. You cannot set yourself free. I don't care who you are. I don't care if you have a master's degree, if you have a PhD, if you wrote all these books, if you're a self-help guru, if you're one of these guys. It doesn't matter, man. Like, no amount of good word or good reads can make you right with God except for Christ Jesus, right? He's the only one that can cover you and cleanse you and convert you and make you the kind of person that you are that you that God wants you to become. Amen? <clears throat> 
And uh, I thank God for that today. Because without him, I don't know where I would be. I probably wouldn't even be here in Bible college. I probably wouldn't be here in seminary. I'd probably be back home in Fresno slinging drugs or an alcoholic or being lazy or, or just being just being like just okay with the mundane life and let all this violence happen in the background, all this chaos. But I don't want that life. I don't want to be like that. I told you that God has a future for me and that God wants to bless me and God wants to bless you and God has a future and a hope for you as well. And if you're here today and you're struggling with sin and you're struggling with something, let me tell you something. We have Jesus. Amen. We got Jesus. We have hope. We have a future. We're under, we're under God's grace. And I thank God's grace for that. <clears throat> and the last point I want to share with you guys is um, shame enables us. But grace disables the power that it has over us. Right? Shame enables us. But grace disables the power that it has over us. Romans 7, 21 to 25. So I find it to be a law that when I want to do what is good, here you go, here you go, here Paul goes again, right? Evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God and my inmost self. But I see in my members another law at war with the law of my mind, making me captive to the law, to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Wretched man that I am, who will rescue me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen? Amen? Amen. That's what Paul is saying, man. It don't matter. It doesn't matter what you are or who you are or what you've done. We got Jesus. Amen? Amen. We got God. We got hope. And that is what it is saying here today. You know, like you've been like, Shame is a powerful thing. Shame is a powerful thing, right? I still struggle with shame sometimes in my life. What does shame do? Shame tells you, okay, you've done this already. Go ahead and do it again. Keep doing it. You know what I mean? Because you, know, you live under that shame. I know what it's like. It sucks. I hate it. But it's still in my life. And I'm, I've been serving Christ for 20 years. So it's something that God has to work inside of me, right? But I know that only God can help me. Only Christ can help me in that, through that, in that process only God can help me and help me to have the holistic healing that he wants for all of us, not just the ones who are saved, but the ones who don't go to church. For God died for the whole world. Amen. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm thankful. And, uh, you know, it's because of God's grace, like I said earlier, that is why I'm here and why I... Uh, I don't deserve to preach his word. I don't deserve to be up here. But because of God's grace, I am. And I hope that in the future that God would continue to work in me. And as I hope he works in you and to help us to do greater works than these so that we can live for Christ and we can tell people about Jesus and about the power that he has to set us free, you know, and that we are not slaves anymore to sin. We're not slaves no more to ourselves, to this world, to this system. But we are free in Christ to live and to hope and to know that we have a future, not just now, but in the world to come. Amen?